thank you, Lord, for loving me, and thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Please reveal your will for me so I can serve you for eternity. Use my life in every way, take hold of it today. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. this works. We're already exhausted. We're only a week into the semester. It's cold. This weekend looks colder and possibly snow. Um, you're in the middle of season or you might be getting ready to start your season. I know this just becomes exhausting right away. But this week in chapel, I really want us to focus in. Um, mostly what I'm going to do today is just simply share what we're going to be doing this week. Um, and then we've got three other people that are going to speak uh, the remainder of our time. Um, what we're going to talk about this week, Ryan, if you could just go to the next slide for me. This is uh, the York College mission statement. You've probably seen it before. I'm not going to ask you if you've memorized it yet. But this is something that the college holds to be very important. And there's one key word on that screen, and it's transformation. And it's a word that gets talked about an awful lot around here. But I started to think, I'm not sure that we actually ever took any time in chapel really just to slow down and think about it. And so what I want to do today is just introduce the idea of transformation. And then tomorrow, Adriana Sotolongo is going to speak, otherwise just known as Dree. And then on Wednesday, uh, Bryce Smith is going to speak. And then on Thursday, Jolene Herzog. And Bryce and Jolene, this time last year, were students. And that's one of the reasons I'm asking them to speak. They work here now. But I want them just to simply to share what it means to be transformed in their experience. Because here's what, these are kind of, it's part one and part two of a question that I want to ask this week. What is God doing in your life, and how are you going to respond? 
What is God doing in your life, and how do you want to respond? The thing with transformation is, is that we do not transform ourselves. We're incapable of doing that. We've talked about that before in chapel. We've talked about the fact that all of you come from so many different variety of backgrounds and contexts, and you have your, your own issues. We all have our own issues to deal with. And as much as we try to manage that and make that work, at times we just can't make it happen. But what we proclaim here at York College, and I hope very loudly and unapologetically, is that we serve a God who is capable of transforming us, of taking us where we are, and placing us somewhere else. And so no matter where you come from and what your background is, I can promise you this, that there is a God who has been active in each and every one of your lives. And the question becomes, how do we respond to that? And that's what I want to hear from the other three this week, is examples of the way God's been working. And their stories are not your story. God is working in your life in very distinct and unique ways. It cannot be replicated with anyone else. And so when we talk about this idea of this great idea of God and all that he's created, God is working in you in very unique and specific ways. It's about what God is doing in your life. And the question becomes, what does that look like? And how will I respond? I want to throw this up because at the end of, uh, or towards the end of um, the mission statement says to equip students for service, and service is a word that I'm sure has gotten used. Some of you probably even went to high schools or were part of organizations that required you to do a certain amount of service hours to meet the obligations to stay in that, right? Uh, even here at York College, your, your athletic team or your performing arts team might do certain kinds of service. But I want to talk even deeper than that, just kind of this generic idea of service. What does it actually mean to become people of service? And so the text that I just kept thinking about this week is on this next slide, Ryan, if you can shoot that. Up there, oh, that is really small, sorry about that. I told her to put it on one screen. This is what Paul has to say to the church in Philippi. If you just listen for just a moment, especially if you haven't heard this before. A lot of people think this was possibly an early Christian hymn that Paul adopted. We're not sure about that. But just simply to say this is a powerful message of what Paul believes God is doing among the people there. And what God has done through Jesus. So I want to look at this real quickly. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who being in very nature God, do not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled, humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I cannot tell you even after hours of conversation with you, I cannot tell you all the ways that God is active in your life. It is so pervasive. It is so internal to who you are. And God is involved in so many different aspects of your life that it's impossible for someone else. It's even impossible for my own self to know all the ways that God is active. But I can say this, and what I really appreciate about that word service in our mission statement, is that I don't know what God is calling you to be. I don't know exactly what God is going to do in your life when you're here and when you leave here. But I do know that God is calling all of us to be servants. Because God cared so much about us that He sent His only Son. And notice the way that Paul describes what Jesus did among us. He became one of us, even though He wasn't one of us. He was royalty. He became one of us, and then He simply served even to death on a cross. And what Paul says is this, no matter what problem you have... To find the answer to that problem, you've got to learn to begin to serve. And what Paul also ultimately says is, if you want to find meaning in your life, learn to serve as Christ Jesus has. Follow Him. My guess is that most of you have been changed in some way in your time here. Maybe it's for the bad, but I'm sure that there's been experiences that have changed you in a positive way. 
My guess is, is that some of those changes because of the service that people perform on behalf of you. The way that faculty and staff give up their time to be here and be a part of this process. When I interviewed at York College, I'd never even been to the state of Nebraska. I got a call on Thursday afternoon from President Ekman that said, can you fly up on Monday? The provost, Dr. Maljoy, is going to be out of town in a couple weeks and we need you to come up now. Okay? So I flew up on a Monday morning. I was here in Nebraska, literally less than 24 hours and left. But the one thing that President Eichmann kept talking about, every conversation I had with him, I don't know if he was trying to sell me on the place or what he was really trying to do, but he did say this. You can make a bigger difference here than you can anywhere else. There's a lot of reasons for that. We're small. We're intimate here. But I think most of the reasons go deeper than that. Because this place, at our very core, what we want to do is become a part of your life, even when you don't want us to. We want to find out what is God doing with you, in what ways is God active in your life, in what ways is God active in my life, and let's see what God is up to. But one of the ways that we really want to be influential is by simply serving. And sometimes serving you doesn't look very nice. It's a teacher pulling you aside and saying, you know what, you can do a lot better than this. It's a coach pulling you aside and saying, you know what, that was not anywhere near full effort. You need to put more into this. It might be uh, Dr. Roush pulling you aside and saying, you know, you need to get with it here. Of course, in a very Dr. Roush kind of way. <coughs> you have an opportunity. It might be the only opportunity in your life quite like this. Where you have space. You have time. You're given permission. You're given permission, you're being blessed to take the space and the time you need to figure out what God is doing in your life and to ask and maybe even answer the important question, so how am I going to respond to that? Because I promise you, when you get finished with college, the chances are it's not going to get any easier. More things start coming at you. Even with all the issues that, that you have while you're in your time in college, it might not get any better. But you have time now. God has given you this opportunity to learn what it looks like to live beyond yourself. To notice that there's something else going on in your life that you might not have noticed before. You might have an inkling of it, but you've not really noticed it before. What I think it's going to look like is when you learn to serve beyond yourself, that you learn to begin to look at your life as Jesus Christ himself did when he came among us, when God sent him. It begins that even though you might decide that you want to be an accountant with your life or a teacher, you might want to be a coach, you might be trying to go to grad school to become a, you know, maybe a PhD in psychology or go to medical school, God bless you. You're trying to figure out what you want to do with your life. But no matter where you find yourself, that there's something more happening in your life than what you're just simply going to do for a living. You might have decided the most important thing in your life is to get married and have kids. The most important thing in your life might be to get back to California or Texas. The most important thing in your life might be to move somewhere, stay there the rest of your life, and just simply raise a family. But there's got to be something more important than that. There's got to be a reason that you do these things. You have the time and space right now. To ask the question, what is God doing in my life? And how do I want to respond? So let's not waste it. I want to hear from these people this week. I want to hear from other people on campus. I want to ask the important questions. What is God doing? What can God do? And what difference can God make in my life? This is your opportunity. There are faculty and staff waiting for you to come to them. To just simply share your story. There are other students here waiting for you to simply come and share your story. There are people all around you who will support you. And that all, might not always be simply just propping you up on what you've always thought and believed. It might be challenging you. It probably will be in significant ways. But there is a God who is at work in your life. There's a God who has served you in such an incredible way. And now he is asking you to be a part of that. So what do you want? What do you really want? What's most important? What do you really think God is doing? Ask those questions. It's not an easy question. I've used the example before, but one of my freshman class, a teacher would get up. He would get up every day and just simply say, what are the prayer requests? And then he would lead a prayer. One day, one of the guys about halfway up in the middle of the room, it was a larger class, there's about 60 of us, 70 of us in there. He said, um, I want prayers that God 
would increase my faith. And for the only time during that semester, the teacher just simply stopped. He didn't say anything. He took his glasses off his face. He thought a little more. And he looked at the guy, and the only time during that semester that he did this, he said, are you sure you want to pray that? There's only been a few times in my life where somebody said that to me directly. It's not very sobering or comforting, right? Come to God, bring your prayer requests, ask God what you need. Are you really sure you want to pray to God? And then he said something that stuck with me forever. He said, because if you ask that prayer, you better be ready. Because God might actually answer it. What are your prayers to God? What are the unspoken prayers to God? The ones that you don't even know how to voice. What I'm saying is this week, let's talk about that. Let's think about that. Let's play the important game. Let's make the important decisions. Let's pray the prayers that matter. God, change my life. What are you doing and in what ways can I respond? But let's be really careful because if we begin to pray that prayer, God might actually answer it. And then you're in for an adventure. But you have the place, you have the space to do that. Let's start this week. Let's don't waste time. Let's make the decision together. Where is God? What is he doing? Let's pray. Our God, you have called an interesting group of people into this room. I can think of no other reason why this diversity, this assortment of people would gather every day to seek wisdom from you. Other than the fact that you've called us here. Father, there are people in this room who are struggling, who have been struggling for a long time, and they can't make sense of those struggles. And I ask for comfort. I ask that you, in the only way that you can, that you would deliver answers. And Father, we know at times those answers don't come quickly. They don't come fast enough for us, but we know that you are working. God, there are people in this room who are joy-filled today. They are in a season of life where everything's making sense, where things are going as they should. And I ask a blessing on those people, that you would continue to grow their faith, that you would continue to work in their life as well. And then there are most of us in between. We don't really know where we are at times. Some of us are even wondering, what am I doing in Nebraska? But God, please, not, please don't let us waste this opportunity. We know you are active. We know you have called us. We know you are at work in all of our lives. God, continue to work and call us forward to learn what it means to follow you. May we not waste our time here. May you continuously knock down our doors to, to help us along. May you continually send people in our lives that can support us, that can walk beside us. May you challenge us when we need challenged. May you comfort us when we need comforted. God, we know you are the one, because of what you have done through your son, you have shown us the way forward. And in the same way you called him to serve in this world, we, we ask that you also, as we know you are, call us to serve. Help us to ask the deeper questions, to pray the, the better prayers, that simply leave us asking you, because we have nowhere else to turn. Thank you for this place. Thank you for this day and this week. May your blessing be on us. Be with us in class. Be with us uh, when we're competing. Be with us when we're performing. Be with us when we're simply being with one another. God, bless our time. Bless our efforts. But most of all, remind us that we are yours. And call us to be even more. It's in your son's name that we pray. <laughs>